Which I would carry everybody. Hey, thank you. Like Dan said, hi, hello, everyone that's new. Uh, I love that you're here, and I hope that you learned something, at least one thing tonight that you can take away back either to your day job or um, in your hobbies as a programmer. Um, so, hello, my name is John Carey. I am a software developer here in the Kansas City area, and I primarily work with PHP and JavaScript in my day job. So, uh, as Dan said, we're trying to cater some presentations more geared towards beginner level programmers, but at the same time, I think my presentation still has some things that more veteran programmers will find useful and informative. Even if you don't have background in PHP, I think that the stuff that I'm talking about tonight should still apply to any other language as well. So if you've worked in any kind of programming language, you've probably seen built-in functions, right? Built-in functionality to a language is a big reason for wanting to use it. So uh, let's start with the example in PHP of what a built-in function might do or look like. So this is a uh, built-in function to the PHP language that ends up building an HTTP query string. And you can see that right down here at the bottom. Uh, usually you'll see this piece on a URL after a question mark. And query string parameters are often used to pass back to the, uh, to the back end of the server. And they will be inspected by the server. And then the server will often return different results as a, re as a result of that. So in this case, HTTP build query is built into the language. Yet, if you look through any custom code anywhere, it's not surprising to find a developer trying to re-implement this function in user land. And that's too bad, because you should definitely use the language and use the functions that are built into it. Soapbox aside. Um, so basically, calling a function is super easy. We're passing in the array at the very top into the function as its primary parameter. We're getting the output or return value of that code and then it comes back just as that simple string. So let's take a look at a custom function, one that you would define your, your, uh, yourself. So like many function examples, this one takes two numbers and adds them together and returns the result. So if we were to use this in our code, it's pretty straightforward. We can take the number two plus the number two and arrive at the number four. Well, wow, it's hits <laughs> magic. So actually PHP doesn't have a built-in sum function. It does in one way in that it will sum all numbers in an array, but it doesn't have one that just says take two plus two. And that's because it actually has other ways of handling that that aren't function related. You don't have to worry too much about that. But uh, so if we can also take 16 plus eight and arrive at 24, that's pretty sweet. So what are custom functions good for? Custom functions are primarily used for blocks of reusable code. So often when you're developing a program, and we'll step through this process just a little bit later, you'll come across code that needs to be the same, but then is slightly different in very, like maybe one small way, might be a couple small ways. And as you work with that code, you as that behavior changes, you don't necessarily want to have to make those changes all over your code base. So if you had one block of code that did one thing and a second block of code that did the same thing with like the bit flipped or like, you know, something different, you would have to maintain that code in two spots. And if you maintain a piece of software for a long period of time, you'll find out that's a bad thing because you'll go back to fix it in one spot and it will come back to bite you because you won't fix it in the other spot. Inevitably that always happens. So um, when we Take reuse, when we take reusable code, our main goal is to make code easy to read and to digest. And by that, custom functions are basically small named functions that you can give any name you want to in, within, a line, within at least PHP. And it's easy to look at that function and know exactly what it does. Since there's so much freedom with naming functions, it's often difficult to give them a good name. So there's there's an, a bit of an art that goes into picking a good name and deciding what it should be and then using that throughout the rest of your code. And we'll practice that a little bit today too. So ultimately we're going for code that is easy to maintain. So before we get too much further, this is kind of the, hey, let's get a definition piece of the, uh, of the presentation. So let's step through the anatomy of a function. And then once we figure out all the pieces of the anatomy, let's figure out how to build functions well. 
So the very first thing that you'll encounter with any function in PHP that you must define is this keyword. The keyword is function. It must prefix any custom function and it basically signals to PHP the next string that I give you is to be interpreted as the name of this function. Pretty straightforward. There's lots of different ways to do things in PHP. Uh, there is actually no shorter way to define a function in PHP than actually having to use the function keyword. So in this case, we can give our function a name. We can give it, I think, almost any name we want. There are a couple characters that a function name can't have in it. I think symbols like dollar signs and ampersands I don't think can be in there, but almost 0 through 9, A through Z, capital, lowercase, underscores, dashes, pretty much anything. Uh, I like to stick to lowercase and underscores for consistency. And I'll do that through the rest of the presentation too. So the next piece of a function are what we call its arguments or its input values. And these are the different values of code that we can feed into this function to get it to do different things. So this function takes two arguments, an argument one named foo and an argument two named bar. So like we saw in our sum function, that's pretty straightforward. We can pass in two and two and sum it out to be four. Inside of our method, we have what's called the function body. And the body is basically any code that's valid anywhere else in your program. You can take literally just, I, I don't think there's anything you can't put inside of a function that you couldn't put in elsewhere. If anyone has any other ideas, I, I didn't think so. So anyway, your function does whatever you want it to do, and that's the repeatable code that you want to execute whenever this function is called. There's one specific part of the body that is a little bit special, and it's called the return statement. And return is uh, another thing that is, you can only return a value from a function when you use the return keyword. Well, so what return does is it returns control back to the piece of code that called that function. So it's kind of a little arbitrary or uh, abstract to think about, but it's almost like the output of the function. So if you're taking two numbers in, you want to output a four as the sum, like in our previous example. So we would return four. So when I think about functions and I think about how to structure them in my mind. Usually I like to map concepts in code to visual concepts and it helps me think about things. So I found that when I think about functions, I think about them really as little machines or little tiny programs. Like you might think of a big program like Facebook or something like that. Well, a function would be the most smallest possible piece of code that you could write. I mean, so a function can be as big as you want and as small as you want, but as we'll see through the rest of, the, of my presentation, I want to focus on trying to make small, self-contained programs. So programs or functions take an input, and the input travels through the function body and then out as the output. So it's, it's plenty fine to talk about input as input and output as output, and that's nice and fine. But for the rest of the presentation and the way that I like to think about uh, my inputs is I like to use the word given. And the way that I use that would be given I have two numbers, foo and bar, or one and two. I expect, I can, and I use the word expect, then talk about my output. So given I have two numbers, I expect to receive the sum of them as the return value. Or given two numbers, I guess this is a this example breaks down pretty quickly. Um, we'll, we'll get to talking about some more examples. So then we have the, the piece of the function that's inside, the function body. And I call that the behavior. And you don't, when you think about code, you might not think about it behaving a certain way. Or like, you might think about it doing something, but behavior, that's usually something we use to ascribe to a human. But I find that it's good to think about the function as something that it's doing internally, like just like, almost like a black box. And it's nice to be able to think about things from the outside first, before you even think about how the function does it. Think about what data you have that's coming into the program and then what data is coming out. So let's step through an example scenario that's a little more detailed than just some. So given that we have a list of users, let's expect that a new list of users would be generated 
and that that list of users would only contain users that their name starts with the letter J. So if we were to want to name this function, what could we possibly name it? I like to think about my function names almost as small abbreviated sentences. That makes them a little bit longer, but it exponentially makes them easier to understand. So that when I go back to it, I can think about, I don't even have to think about how the code does what it does. I'm simply reading the function that says users with J names. And users with J names might look like this as a function definition. Pretty straightforward. We have a you know, their function keyword, users with J names, it's easy to read. Uh, users is the primary argument. So now if we start thinking about, we, we know what our input is, we know what our given is, we know that it's given. Our output is going to end up being a new array or a new collection of users. So without even writing the implementation, I, my function now at least knows what data type it needs to return from the outside world. What, what, what are its expectations and what does that behavior eventually get coded into it? So we're kind of going from the outside and becoming much more narrow as we approach actually what this does. So this leads us, without getting into the behavior and everything, this leads us to our very first rule, my one of four rules that I want to talk about tonight. And that first rule would be a well-named function describes what the function does and not how it does it. And this is really important because as a program evolves and as a program changes, the behavior is always going to change. All right? that's, the, that's your primary reason for changing an existing program, is that it needs to do something new. If you can name your functions in a way to where the name is solid, but maybe you need to change how it does it, there's much less room for error in your program. So if we were to take this, users with J names, it you know, reads as a sentence, that's excellent. So let's actually now fill in a little bit of the implementation. Let's get down to a little bit of the details. And this is our first code heavy slide here. So if you've written any PHP before, hopefully this looks a little bit familiar. So we're going to take in a list of users and a list of users we can use a concept called for each where it basically goes through our list of users and takes each one and executes this next block of code on it. So for each user in, in our collection we want to evaluate whether basically this gets down to checking whether the first character in the user's name is J. We're using an internal function to PHP called string position and what that does is it looks at like a user's name like John or Jim or Eric and takes a second argument, the capital J or whatever letter we're looking for, and it finds what number character that is in the string. So if we're thinking about uh, John, the first number would actually be zero. And if you're a beginner programmer, you might think, well, why, why is zero the first character? Like we start from counting at one, right? Well, computers actually mostly start counting from zero in most places. So strings are zero indexed, so we can look for the very first character to be J. And if it is, if this statement inside this if parentheses evaluates to true, then the next line will be executed. And this is a shorthand way for taking the user that we're working on and adding it to our filtered list of users that meet all the needs that we are looking for. So if we had you know, three users, John, Jim, and Eric, John and Jim would be added to the array, but when this if statement gets to being called with Eric's name, there's no J in Eric's name. So it would, it would just skip right over it. It wouldn't even be called a filtered user. So that, finished, that code block would finish, and then we would get to our return statement. We would return that new list of users that contains two people, John and Jim. So this block of code with users with J names works fantastic until we start needing users with K names and L names and all of that. So you could maybe on the first time you need K names, copy your J function and just change J to K. Yeah, no big deal. But as you get into it, you know, there's 26 letters in the, in the alphabet and you don't really want to end up with 26 copies of the same block of code. So you want to figure out a way to find the pieces that change in your program and make those into variables. So let's go back to our given expect and let's modify what we're doing to then 
uh, build a new function. So we would be changing given to be a list of users and one letter, and we would expect a new list of users whose name starts with that one letter. A name for this function might be user's name begins with. And it reads a little bit funny, and that's partly because this is kind of a hard function to name. We could sit here and draw out an entire sentence to name this function. We could have said, users with name where letter begins with, or you know something like that. And that just got to be a little bit too long. So I condense it down into four words, and anything longer might have just been a little bit too long. So err on the side of too long rather than too short, because you wouldn't necessarily want to say users with letter, because that doesn't actually mean users whose name starts with one letter. It might be user's name that contains that letter, and your behavior would be different than your function name, and that would not be such a good thing. So let's take a look at what this implementation might look like. We have given, again, given a list of users and a letter. We want a new list of users whose name is starting with that letter. So that's what leads us to our second rule. When thinking about functions, separate what changes from what stays the same. And you can think about this as what changes become the arguments to your function, and what stays the same is the code inside, or the behavior. So here's our function again. Again, our name definitely is kind of wonky, but we've come to accept that. We know that our list of users can change. We could feed in any type of list of users, be they coming from our database, from some external application, from the command line, and same with our letter. So the next piece that I kind of want to talk about, now that we know that these are both well-named and uh, they change uh, is different than what stays the same, is uh, the return type. So good functions will always return the same value type. And by this, in this case, if we jump back to what we expect this function to do, we're expecting a list of users. Now in PHP, there are different language or uh, different value types that I'll highlight here in a second, but no matter what path this function takes to execute, it will always end up returning an array of some kind. Like if users was blank, if we passed in a list of empty users, this would just skip over this block completely and just return an empty array. So no matter what, whatever function calls this method, it will always get back a list that it can do what it expects given a list. So you wouldn't want to return false or return a null or return a number as zero or something like that. You would want to return an array. So good functions have the return type that's the same return the same type of value given any input. So here's basically the different value types that you could pass in or that you could expect back from a function. Integers, which are basically just numbers. Floats, which um, have decimal points in them. Boolean, true or false. Pretty straightforward stuff. And again, it's, it's mostly the array piece. But oftentimes, I'll see programmers write functions where, in some cases, it would return a string and in other cases, it would return false. Those aren't the same value type. If you were returning this, uh, a function that returned a string, you would just want to return an empty string. That way it can operate the same way no matter uh, what it's expecting. So I think we pretty much drilled that home. If you're a more experienced programmer, you might be thinking like, well, so what happens if a user passes in the number zero for a letter? Well, that's not a correct value type, right? It's okay to throw exceptions. It's okay to return early. Um, it's okay to throw errors to the console. It's just don't return false, don't return null, that kind of stuff. Any questions so far? What's up? Would there be a time that you would want a function to convert a string, for example, to an array? So is that rule, would you say that that's always hard and fast, or would there be times that that I, th I could definitely see times where you would want to be more liberal in the types of values that you're accepting, where if you took in, let's say, your letter, what if your programmer thought, well, I know that letters are actually ASCII number representations and that the number 55 actually correlates to the letter A. Ha ha, 
compute that. You could do an ASCII lookup if, like let's say you implemented this function to begin with in C and you were expecting a number, but then dumped it out to a new language that actually supported better string types. And then you said, well, to keep backwards compatibility without having to change everything in my code, I'll accept both. So if I, if I receive a number, do the lookup or whatever, convert it to uh, its equivalent string, you could definitely do that. So the next concept I want to talk about is, is called scoping. And scoping is kind of an advanced topic if you're not familiar with it, and it will definitely bite you at one time or another as a programmer. So in PHP, the two types of scoping I want to focus on are called global and local variable scoping. <clears throat> so global scoping is super easy to understand because by default, anything that's inside of a PHP tag that's not inside of a function is in the global scope. And by global, it's like the most outside scope you can get. There's no universal scope. I mean, that would be kind of funny, but um, maybe that's true. I, I come up with this here. Uh, we'll get back to global scope in a second. Global scope is basically, so if we define this variable A in the global scope, and then we try and define a function called test, and then we're going to just echo out what that variable A is, it actually wouldn't, or and then we're just calling test down here, it actually wouldn't echo one, it would actually throw an error. And that's because the function, when it goes to execute, doesn't know about any of the variables declared outside of it. So it would actually just blow up in our face. That's not cool. But if we were to support local variable scope, we can tell the function that we have a variable named b that we want to consider uh, for the rest of the method. So when we go ahead and call it down at the very bottom, we will pass in the letter or number a. It will come up into the variable b and be available here as a 1. So there are ways to actually cheat this system and you may have seen them if you've worked in PHP for a while, and that would be using a keyword called global. Now, a lot of older PHP code, something like older versions of Drupal, older versions of WordPress, almost any older PHP code you'll find will actually use this uh, keyword to bring, bring, bring variables into its own scope. And it's kind of a lazy way of programming. It's just kind of reaching out into space and grabbing whatever you want into the function. And I understand that, you know, again, software lives for a long time and you have to do what you got to do to make it work. Um, but this is not a practice that you want to do if you're writing like a brand new project. If your framework can avoid it, if you have the opportunity to pass in your own variables, you should definitely do that first. So if we were to uh, call this code now, realize we're not, we don't have a variable here. We're no longer passing any variable in. And actually this is wrong code down here. Um, when we call this, it will actually output one because it's grabbing global or it's saying, yo, I want the variable A from the global scope, which is out here. And then actually making it accessible inside of our function. So please try and avoid that if possible. So in some other types of code, you'll see these dollar sign uppercase variables. And I talked about globals earlier. There's actually in PHP such thing as a super global, as if global wasn't good enough. So super globals are something you've probably seen if you've worked with forms in PHP before. And a lot of people use PHP to parse form input coming from browser. And they've probably seen the dollar sign get and dollar sign post. So the funky thing about super globals is that they're accessible anywhere. You don't even have to use the global keyword to bring them into a current scope. So that's kind of good because, well, you can get access to cookies. You can get access to the server variables, the environment variables. You can just, you can just bring it in whenever you want. But it's also bad because you don't necessarily know where this get has been before it gets into your function. Um, PHP is unfortunate in that the rest of the code can actually modify the super globals 
at any time. And then when you go to access it again later, the value's changed. So if you expected a number to come from your form, you know, like a combo box selection, and all of a sudden it's a string, well, what piece of your program did it? Is it, you know, the form or is it some other code that accidentally reassigned it somewhere? So it's kind of hard to keep track of where that code has been and where it's going. So if we were to um, visit this URL up here, domain.com, we pass in, remember our HTTP query string from before, name equals John. Uh, the name key gets put into the get super global right here. And we would just run the function test and it outputs my name. So the thing with functions is we talked about their arguments and we talked about their return values. And this leads me to my last point that is good for functions and that is you should control what goes in and what comes out as much as possible. You can use global as a last resort or you know if your framework or whatever doesn't allow you to do so otherwise it's just you know an unfortunate way of working with some code. It's not the end of the world. Nobody will axe murder you for doing that. But um, so anyway, what goes in is definitely try and accept them as arguments to your function whenever possible. And what comes out of your function is usually a return, a return value, or should be. It's definitely possible to output things in different ways. You could directly print from your inside of your function if you wanted to, and often that's where a lot of people start. They find that they're building a web page and they need to echo out, you know, a number. And instead of echoing out that number everywhere they want, they can just wrap it inside of a function to do some kind of code or processing before they output it. That's okay, given the context. Um, but try and use return where you can. So overall, um, the function that we kind of wrote today or we looked at for a while is actually pretty good. We can see that it's not using global. It's not pulling in super global variables from anywhere. It's accepting everything as an argument. And we're controlling what comes in and controlling what goes out through our return statement at the very bottom. So all four of the points that I talked about today, it's well named. Our user name begins with. We've separated what changes from what stays the same. And what changes was our attributes, or I'm sorry, our uh, arguments there at the top. Our function body stays the same. We have a consistent return type and array, and we control everything that comes in and comes out. Like this is actually like a super, really good function. If you if I saw this in like a beginner level developers program, I'd say that they like probably couldn't do much better because that's great. So one last point that I want to make before I'm finished is this is to revisit this concept of these little programs that we're building with functions. So. You can imagine that this large program, Facebook or you know, Google Mail or whatever, you, is not just one big function. It's mostly a lot of really small functions that are composed together and kind of put in a big chain to make this bigger program that we know as Facebook or whatever else. So again, we can use this function visual. If we build functions, we can take the output of one function and feed it into another. You can sometimes hear this process called pipelining. If you're familiar with the Unix command line, it has the pipe, which is basically that. It takes the output of the previous function and feeds it as input into the next function. And as we build up functions, we kind of get other little programs, you know, maybe three functions in a row does one specific thing. And we end up with one big program. So if, if this is like Facebook, if this program is Facebook, your web browser is sending in a request. It, with it, it has everything like what user you're currently logged in as, what the previous page you visited was, a bunch of other stats about you. And then P or Facebook internally does all of its querying. It looks up who your friends are, what the most recent posts are, um, all of that kind of stuff. And all that kind of lives in little small functions and packages inside this bigger program. So if you can gravitate towards trying to build small functions that do one thing, then you're totally ahead of the game. One point that I forgot to add with this build small programs is relative to point number one, and that is well-named functions. And that should be that if you ever find yourself using the word and, or the word or, in your function, it's a sign that it might possibly be doing two or more things. And it's a, it's a sign that you might want to actually break it up into two functions. So that's just a, a little tip off that I find myself doing sometimes too.
So that's my introduction to functions in PHP. And I love this little graphic, it makes me happy. So if anyone has any other questions, I would love to answer them now. Do you have any standard uh, link code for a function that you target? That's an excellent question. It's definitely relative to the type of project I'm working on and maybe even the data that I'm working with. Um, I find that for me, I'm good at between, you know, maybe one or two lines on like the very short end, maybe like eight to 10 on the long end. So the function that we just uh, displayed, this guy, I mean, it's basically not given white space, one, two, three, four, kind of five, kind of six. So it's like right in that happy, happy range, I think. Any time after that, like if we had to put in another block of code down here before the return statement, it might actually be a sign that it could be two functions that are being done. Like this is simply just filtering out users with J names or with a letter's name. If you needed to do something else, you would probably want to use it instead as use the output of this function to then do more work on it. So that's kind of my, my feeling, my work. And it's definitely harder when you're working in something like uh, WordPress or if you're working in like a template language. I mean, PHP is a template language, but um, I don't know. Try and pick a number. Pick, it, pick an arbitrary number and say, today I will not write a function longer than 10 lines and see how well you can stick to it. Yeah. Dan, do you have any questions or anything I should add? Maybe some hints at what we'll expect to see in parts two and three? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so parts two and three that I planned, uh, we will dig a little bit into anonymous functions and uh, closures, which are uh, functions that you can name without, I'm sorry, functions you can define without giving them a name. And that might sound kind of crazy given what I just talked about with well-named functions. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and how you can maybe write what we did there in that filtering users with J names in a little bit more of a simple fashion where we even control even more what goes in and what comes out and we're going to make it condensed a little bit. And then part three, um, I don't remember what part three is. I wrote it out in a big outline and Dan and Eric both were instrumental in talking me off the ledge of trying to present too much at one time. They said, John, let's break it down. Let's keep it simple. Um, so hopefully this was at a good enough level and people got something out of it. Uh, I don't have the feedback URL, but I think that we use a website called Joined In that we like to solicit feedback from people. So you can either feel free to talk to me uh, after my talk. I do have to leave early tonight, I apologize. Um, or you can type up some comments either on Meetup or on Joined In and leave those for me, like what I could do better or what you liked about the talk, or what you expected but didn't get anything that you would like to tell me. Eric? These slides will be posted. I will make the slides available on the Meetup page, uh, and I will link them so you can review them later. So you can sit there and meditate over the four rules that I proposed. OK, if there's no other questions. Um, Andrew, how are you feeling back there? Would you be ready to roll? Great. Why not? Cool. Thanks, everyone.